Oh boy, um, we're live on YouTube. It's happening. Um, so if you don't want to be um, recorded, go ahead and um, stop video and mute yourself so that everyone can can see um, who's who's talking and stuff like that. Okay, so um, hello and welcome um, to Malvern Books' virtual space. Um, we're so thrilled to be celebrating the launch of Erin Fagan's new book, A Better Place is Hard to Find. It is an amazing book um, and we're so thrilled that he reached out to us and was interested in being a part of our little virtual space here. Um, so be sure to um, support him and buy the book. Um, and then we also have a special guest, Nick Flynn, which we have his book, I Will Destroy You. Um, and he also has a new memoir out. So be sure to check that out as well. Um, so this is going to be a really awesome, um, you know, reading of poetry, a little multimedia action is going to happen. Um, so really thrilled about that. Um, and also, uh, if you have any questions for our readers throughout the event, be sure to put it in the chat box and I'll take a look and see, uh, and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and start the event. How does that sound? Oh my gosh. Um, so our first reader tonight is going to be Nick Flynn. Um, and we're so thrilled to have you here with us, Nick. Um, live from Brooklyn, New York, so a little bit of a ways away, but so exciting that you can join us here. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce Nick Flynn. All right. Nick Flynn is a writer, playwright, and poet. His most recent books are This Is the Night Our House Will Catch Fire, a hybrid memoir, and Stay, threads, collaborations, and conversa conversations, which documents 25 years of his collaborations with artists, filmmakers, and composers. His acclaimed 2004 memoir, Another Bullshit Night in Suck City, was made into a film starring Robert De Niro in 2012. He is also the author of five collections of poetry, including most recently, I Will Destroy You. Flynn's poems, essays, and nonfiction have appeared in the New Yorker and the Paris Review, and on NPR's This American Life. His film credits include Field Poet, an artistic collaborator for the film Darwin's Nightmare, which was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Feature Documentary in 20, 2006. He has been awarded fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the Library of Congress and currently teaches creative writing at the University of Houston. Please welcome Nick Flynn. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Kelsey and Aaron. Thanks so much for asking me to be here. Uh, it's, I, I really love A Better Place is Hard to Find. I'm really happy to be uh, here to celebrate it. Uh, we're here to celebrate Aaron's new book. Uh, and uh, I'm really happy about that. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm going to read uh, about, I think, five new poems. Um, and they're all based on, uh, I have a collage making uh, 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 what do you call it, a, a practice, collage making practice. And uh, for the month of December, I wrote a poem a day uh, based on these collages. I would just sort of meditate on these collages and then write these poems sort of very quickly. So I'm gonna just show the poems that I, I wrote, the five poems from, they'll just be sort of uh, going in a, in a little loop. Um, and, uh, uh, and I'll just read the poems for you and then we'll uh, move on to Aaron. So, all right, I'm gonna share the screen now. It always takes a second, but there it is. Okay, I'll start. <clears throat> Cyclops. The strippers hung their robes on nails, their names on a piece of cardboard tacked to the door. Candy, what lives inside us is monstrous. It comes out of our mouths at night. Sometimes as a song, the song bees sing in the hive, the song ants sing in the hill. Sometimes it's a word, 
the one used to pry the jar open, but mostly it's just air. It fills the house as we sleep. I've been that boy. Now I'm that man, a hole in the ceiling where my foot came through. I wake up alone and can see it evaporate. What was I looking for in the attic? I cannot say. That woman who crawled last night in through the window, where have you gone? Why, don't you want this, you asked? I told you how I woke up one day with nowhere to be, cold pizza in the back seat, my car sideways in the driveway, and me sideways inside it. I told you how I'd climb to the roof and toss appliances into the burned out shell next door, dead refrigerator, dead stove, dead washing machine, silent as they fell. Ants build the hill they live in, wasps chew wood and pulp it into a nest. I built that car around me. I know it hurt you. I tried to warn you. I tried to warn everyone. Quarry. You claim that a person who begs is praying and that a person who prays begs. It's not your fault. You never knew me. Outside so long, the hole I leave behind is, like you, God-shaped. On Swan Island, a hole was carved in the earth, the exact inverse of a cathedral. Workers spent years with chisels. Then their children took over until it could be lifted out in one piece, put onto a barge, and floated to the city. Teenagers swim through its steeples now, through nave and altar, portico and arch. The sun moves its shadow around them all day, first here, then there. It's all they know of time. The day will come, maybe today, to smash all the windows and go inside. You cannot say you didn't see it coming. Those trees at the edge of the field, each is made of nothing but air. Otherwise, there would be a hole the size of a tree beneath each tree. This one's called Pegasus. All the rain in the world is falling, making a door you can't open. On one side of this doorway, your body, you are inside it now. On the other side, your other body, the one you've been trying to enter since you were born. As a newborn, you were held close to your father's chest to imprint his smell upon you. Where did he go? From here, you can almost make him out, the, one, the who you wanted to be, though he is more a silhouette than a hand you could hold. To find yourself, you must cross this threshold of rain. Each drop whispers, you will not be this beautiful forever. One day you will grow so luminous, this world will not be able to contain it. Besides, it hurts to have skin, to pour a soul into. I, didn't, I don't know how you do it, moving from nodding out to mountaintop, from ecstasy to falling leaves. I'm stalling. I wonder if he's hungry. Am I hungry? I could feed him with a spoon. Careful now, a hole has opened at your feet, all the rain spiraling down it. It has nowhere to go. Like that chart on the wall in elementary school, the water cycle, how it leapt from liquid to gas, to solid, to teardrop, to icicle, to steam, to waterfall, to piss. Nothing is ever lost. No one is ever unlost. The air, like the rain, is full of creatures we cannot see. Peering into the first teardrop, Van Leeuwenhoek asked, where does it stop? Then the Lumiere brothers asked a naked man to walk across a room. Then they asked a girl to take off her blouse, telling her this moment will now last forever, and it has. Then they asked a horse to gallop across a field and froze it midair. Until that moment, despite all the stories, no one knew that a horse could fly, all its hooves off the ground.
All right. This one's called Kierkegaard. It's the penultimate poem, Kierkegaard. That was the year that never left us. That was the year we all sang the same song. I found a cave in the breakwater. It lit up at high tide. And as the sun came down through the top of the ocean, it didn't hurt as much. Light leaked from my eyes. My doctor made a joke about dying. I laughed at how quickly none of this matters. I thought it would hurt more, leaving things undone. I carried you until you too until you grew too big to carry. It was a dream and you were the contents of the dream. If we speak of it, it will vanish. I wanted you to carry me across the marsh and beyond the broken houses, but I hated that I had to ask. It made the day shimmer. All right, this is the last one. Thanks everybody for being here. This is called Self-Portrait with Bees. Six sides to each chamber, chamber stacked on chamber until it is a city. Inside this, there is no up. As a child, I was an acrobat. I could hold my friend upside down on my head. I could stand on his shoulders and open my arms to the ocean. If we fell, we'd land on the earth. We wouldn't fall forever. Or if we fell forever, at least we'd be together. I don't know now where my lovers are, the ones that live in the past, tangled up with another lover, I hope, or alone in a car on a flat desert highway, if that's what was needed. All of this is happening inside my head. All of this is happening inside your head. All of this has already happened or will happen soon enough. That boy balanced upside down on my head. He's upside down now somewhere else. It doesn't matter where bees live, beside what field, inside what tree, what they build will always be this geometry. Six-sided, each chamber the exact size of a thought, big enough to sleep in. I didn't know you'd be coming today, or I knew, but I didn't know you'd be you. Balanced for those few moments, head to head, we can feel our thoughts moving in and out of each other. Here's one now. We are driving across country. The country is America. There's so much I want to tell you. Too much about what's behind, not enough about what's ahead. We cannot keep our hands off each other as if we could mold each other's bodies into the shape of this car. This car is home. The hive is home. The road is home. Your arms are home. The flickering bulb in the hallway that needs replacement is home. All right, thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop sharing now. Yay, that was so wonderful. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you. Um, I'm a really big fan of both poetry and collage, so that was a real treat. Um, so um, a reminder to everyone here that if you were interested in purchasing Nick's um, latest poetry collection, I Will Destroy You, we have copies here in the store, so you can give us a call um, or you can order from bookshop.org. Um, so hope you guys um, did a lot of really great poetry snaps in the background for Nick. Um, and then I'm super thrilled to introduce our next reader. Um, we're here to celebrate the launch of his wonderful new book, A Better Place is Hard to Find. Um, we also have copies here in the store, so please do give us a call um, and order them. I'm super, super honored to welcome and introduce Aaron Fagan. Aaron Fagan was born in Rochester, New York in 1973 and educated at Hampshire College and Syracuse University. His poems have appeared in Granta, Harper's, Poem A Day, and the Yale Review. 
His third poetry collection, A Better Place is Hard to Find, was published this past fall by The Song Cave. Please help me in welcoming Aaron to the virtual stage. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Thank you for that beautiful reading, Nick. Um, I've read and admired your work for a really long time. So this is it's very special for me personally. So thank you very much. Um, try to project a bit more. Sometimes it takes me a while to shake the nerves off. But um, I'm going to start with a poem uh, called My Lonesome Cowboy, which uh, takes its title uh, in part from the Warhol movie, Lonesome Cowboys, but then uh, the Japanese artist Takashi Murakami had a sculpture titled My Lonesome Cowboy, which had nothing to do with Warhol's movie. And my poem has nothing to do with the movie or with the sculpture. So um, My Lonesome Cowboy. The vulture at the kitchen table has the body of a man spinning ice around in his tumbler with a swizzle stick. Eyes training on me, vacuuming the living room poorly. The one judging the situation here is me. The stained beak and centuries of death that made it are neutral. Who is the vulture not to say a word about the ways we betray our instinct to destroy all we love by loving? These moments line up and lash themselves to stakes we say we'll stand in the fire to endure time immemorial. And we would not be wrong to believe it and then not. The cord gets yanked out of the socket. The vulture skids the chair away from the table and stands taller than expected, walking over to me and then away, leaving a gift in my hand. This may or may not make sense to you, but I let the flower die, so it belongs to me. Quandary. This poem uh, sort of emerged from a meditation practice. Um, I've got some quite a few folks that have come tonight have been a part of various meditation groups that I've been a part of in the past. And uh, there's some images and sensibilities in this poem that are born out of that practice. So quandary. You don't have to become one with the universe to become one with the universe. You already are. Breath, a portal to the present, Doubt, a form of time travel. Life runs parallax to life. The heart carries artifacts of sound from another world where silence and all possible outcomes bathe in simultaneity, searching for common repair. This is why I am not me. The breath is not mine. Uh, this next poem, if I, if I had an epigraph for it, I'd probably take the line from uh, Albert Camus' book. He says, uh, one must imagine Sisyphus happy. Harmony. Sisyphus punches in each morning at a mountain he must face all day in hell for eternity. And at night, Having not reached the summit, again, he walks down slow where the rock rushed by, careful to see with new eyes where it all went south again. And then later at the bar in town, sits cooling his bleeding hands against a whiskey on the rocks and maps new paths on a napkin inside the wet ring his tumbler made again and again the roots running on to absurd lengths, hands shaking. And if it wasn't a map, you might think it was the history of history. 
or parts of a nude in repose, patient with death and belonging. The title for this poem is Apricity, which means the, the warmth of the sun in winter. Apricity. We stand at the quarry's edge, trying to take photographs before we run out of daylight. Its perimeter, overgrown, has taken the appearance of a pyre. Our five centuries together are nearly done. The time has come for us to smile and build our nest of branches. Each thought now takes its shape from the floating world and passes by as empty colors and forms. We draw out our illusions on each other and end our lives in the aftermath. And out of us, something else entirely is born to live on. When time gives way to the gathering light, it takes its cradle, our grave, and whirls us into the center of oblivion to be consumed by the breezes of the winter sun. Unrelenting, a snow begins. This is three kinds of everything. Dawn approaches and abundances stampede. Our bodies make love as we weep and dream with an effulgent smell of death engulfing us. We lie to each other about the way we feel, bend time, curve space, to discover in tandem what love is only by what is left of love when love returns, whether by death or dismantlement, to begin inch by inch, through suffering and song, as though this unrehearsed yet familiar way leads to the place breath insists us on too, melting edges off the fact we have come so far yet just begun. What happens stalls out within the fear we have seen the truth of an instance a little too clearly, and now we are living only for emergencies. The good light. There were always such beautiful shadows in your work, though many now dodge their taxes with your art. Rarely as it seems, life involves death with every decision, which is why I miss the non-Euclidean idiom we used to argue over everything in the dictionary of what not to do. Somewhere in a mix between beaches and Haxan, I have these weird memories of you sleeping when there's no way I was there to see you sleeping. A crystal ball above your bed lets tensors and attention of tenses tongue tie time and divine your urge to fearlessly abandon yourself to love as you understand love. Where paradox gives way to paradox and awareness is congratulated with awareness of how this multiverse in vast tribulation ushers us on in unison as one of many big bangs begins again to light the way. The unanswering. I thought I saw a bee's nest made of cigarette butts hanging from the ceiling fan. Each turn of the winding air divined my rest in inelegant proof no one cares to hear. I muddled the idea of who I came to be with soot as drapes caressed the snow globe filled with venom on the sill where moths by their measure lined up one by one, unrolling their tongues to sip and drizzle lines across a canvas laced with gunpowder burning bright around the painted parts where you used to be.
this poem's a little bit longer, but not too long. Um, the title it refers to a lay, L-A-Y, which is just a fancy pants word for a song. Uh, the lay of Tantalus as an insult to the library of dreams. One more go with the west wind to anchor in Cora. Soar into every cell of self, terrifyingly lit from within, a godhead screams, bursting from your hair in flames. Yes, life is a rough trade. Prose is a prison, poetry a prism. Snakes fuck at your feet. Four mirrored triangles hover radiant at your chest each synchronized to autonomous laws. They do the police in different shades of the fifth element as sparks of consciousness broker the harmony between, dispelling the little lunacies which make the otherwise sound unhappy. Hell is still empty, the devil's still here. If I don't know where to go, I'll get there. You might not square the circle, but at least abandon the tan house. Ovid is our supervisor, who loves following the fleeing forms of entertainment as the end fills the hand with fronds and picks berries lovingly. Dying releases the love withheld in life. Something in us adores a puzzle, concentration, and Elsa's ejaculation. I want to die, I want to live between this love embrace. In giving, you find the art you wanted is still spoiling cannibals' fun. We must be drawn backward. The wheel inside the wheel is the part containing the whole. The monument comes down with the legacy. Come in, come in. You'll see what you've never seen before. Literacy still means learning to unlearn and learn again. Even if my fears prove to be justified, it doesn't matter. Objects have lost their value in this terrible time of war, and it's always a time of war. D minor is the key of tragedy. Tempered by the active and the passive voice communicant, may I say wherever we go, togetherness is our home now. Love calls us back to the middle path and seals the union within. Tattoo and take care not to deny the holiness of the heart's affections. Addiction is a greed, fear a theft. If language spoke, it would say, my true sentence is to be a guardian. I love you infinitely. Words stopped your restless steps inches from the abyss. Words are in a state of constant alert on your behalf. Having dispensed with every game of patience, off we go to bed with the dream at the end of the universe that has been with you from the moment of birth to the moment of birth and death. You, you cannot imagine what harms you from what will save you. Anyone who has been lost knows the truth of resurrection. When I ask you to protect me, you say, I love to protect you. I'm gonna read a, a new poem. Uh, this is titled, Everything You Do is a Balloon. Some mischief still in the joy I suffer through song drawn from a ghost box roving across frequencies. When you can stop, you don't want to. And when you do, you can't. I tried to say what I saw, but I didn't know how. So I said what felt true, even if no one else could understand. You can tell me how you came to tell certain of your stories, but no one has been able to tell me how to tell mine, not even me. Moments in a field of presence missed. Your eyes lost in distant waves rise and fall in search of an image to hang on the smell of a corpse 
rotting in the sun, potential energy patient with the release. At this scale, the loneliness of the soul is generic. Time runs backwards. The universe comes to a halt. Um, looking at the time here, I didn't realize how quickly I was reading through all of those. Um, going to see if I can find another couple to read here. This is a poem called Quietus. Before my memory leaves, I would like to say one late summer afternoon, daylight was at its peak intensity. The lights were off inside, everywhere. Then through the windows, the light made its own light in the absence of light, and an effect quite real, grand and ineffable, as precisely inscrutable as the present moment and as quickeningly sublime raked through the room. I stood there a long time, alone, and had to live with a distinct feeling radiating from the condition something complete had been filed with the terrible library of dreams and experience that are about to begin. This poem's called Relic. My hammer blew nails all day into wood to stay for years. The design dates back to Rome, but you will know mine from others when my day comes by the way it has been worn down to nothing. From creation and revision, the past in its claw, the future in its face. poem's called Confederacy. She wakes on the riverbed. He walks out on the water and bends to his knees. She slowly rolls herself over, briefly lost in a cloud of silt, and rubs her eyes open. Sun bouncing off the water is blinding him, and the light behind him is blinding her. They wait the day this way for night to lower him beside her for eternity. She offers him a few mossy stones to put under his head. He feeds her some flowers. The river bumps them up against each other every so often and they smile. The weather is picking up. They will help each other carve their story in ice. This poem's called Farmers. I was young, so when I knelt in a pew as I would with my back facing the altar, no one cared. Each mass I'd stare at the wall where the farmers stood and smoked near the door before the fields. At consecration, without show, each would drop their hat into one knee in one fluid most motion such that the knee would hit the hat on the floor at the same time. And the faith before them came through clear and neutral before me.
And I'll read one more new poem and I think uh, we can sort of see if some folks have some questions and hear some feedback from our friends. Uh, th this is a new poem called Exploded View. I no longer know what it is to love and be loved. It used to mean weakening and being weakened by one through subtle extractions from the herd. The weaker, the better for fealty. Meat is meat rendered to a bone willingness for surrender. No idol in the alchemy of occurrence to declare. Patience lets you wander in your lead, leading me to the place duplicities enshrined in you disperse in ways that may or may not be, our, be your own, where I unmake your plangent desire to penetrate mine. You act enchanted by the sound of your own voice. I am love come to destroy history with a calithump. Every death an exercise and affection on the body. We've passed through so many on our way to you. So, thank you. <laughs> so many little poetry snaps and claps. I wish we could all be in the room and like hear that together. Um, wow, Erin, that was so beautiful. Thank you. I feel so, um, so like blessed by that reading. Um, poetry has really, I don't know about you guys, but poetry has really helped me a lot through um, the pandemic and through this this hard time. So what a what a treat it, it has been tonight with you both. Thank you. I, I love that Aaron um, that you you went went off the map that you went into the white the white space without because you the, the reading went you know you you ran out of uh, uh, the time went longer than you thought. I, I thought I, I actually love those extra poems that you read because uh, it seemed like they were um, yeah they were like a real gift. They were sort of this unexpected gift. I love the farmer's poem. It's gorgeous. Like I love your sort of these distilled moments that you have uh, in the work, and that one, like you know, especially and then the last one too, the new one, the exploded view one, is like, you know, that's a killer poem. I no longer know what it is to to love and be loved. Meat is meat rendered, and it's just that's that's a wild poem. Um, so I'm so glad that we got to hear those. You know, we wouldn't have heard those if if we had stuck to the schedule. If I had read longer. Uh, and then we wouldn't have got to hear like your, uh, these, these other poems that you weren't planning to read, uh, which is a real treat. Thank you. Thanks, man. I, was, I was curious, you know, uh, today I was reading through a number of uh, Alan Dugan poems. I was going to read one of his and, you know, he, he was my absolute hero uh, yeah. in, in college and has just been a total source for me. And you actually had the opportunity to meet him when you were at Provincetown. I was just wondering. Oh, I, I worked with him, yeah, I worked with him quite a bit. I mean, and we became friends. Uh, Ed Dugan is, you know, one of the great American poets. And I, I can see now like your, uh, like, like I can see the influence on your work now when, I, when you say that, I didn't know that before, but to hear that there's these sort of philosophical meditations, these sort of wrestling with what it is to be alive, you know, against this sort of, uh, these metaphysical questions uh, that are grounded in like the, uh, you know, he was such like a, a, a you know, a communist, uh, you know, proletariat worker, poet. Uh, and to have that, like, um, to, to hear that, I could really hear that in your work also. So I was, I was wondering where you got that from. So it's nice to hear that Dugan uh, was, is, is a great influence. Uh, yeah. I hope you all know Alan Dugan, the great, the great Alan Dugan. He's an amazing poet. Um, he was he was great. He was great to um, to get to know him. He was he was an amazing guy. Uh, uh, you know, he, he was one of the founders of the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, where I was a fellow, where I was just starting out. It, you know, it's a, a a seven month residency in the winter for emerging artists, like ten visual artists and ten writers, get together for seven months, seven sort of uh, months in the winter in Provincetown, which is pretty remote and uh, and and it could be called bleak. Uh, but uh, you sort of forced, you're thrown together with this, in, into this community and uh, figure out how to, you know, what to, how to fill your days, you know. Uh, and uh, Dugan was a big part of that. About, about uh, you know, he would he would show up for all the readings and uh, come come to the the 
uh, potluck dinners and just hang out. He was, he was a spirit. Yeah, a good spirit. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Thank yeah. you. Sure. Um, I like that we had also these overlap too. Like we had like, um, uh, you know, you had quarries in yours, you had bees in yours, you had like these, uh, you know, we had this overlap of our, our what we were talking about. Um, yeah, I noticed the same thing. I was like, oh, this is, this will be, get some nice correspondences going. <laughs> you, you had, you had a couple echo. I had a question for you. You had a couple echoes in lay, lay of uh, Tantalus is an insult to the library of dreams. I mean, this is a crazy title. Uh, and you have like right at the beginning, you have a, a, a reference to the wasteland that to the draft of the wasteland, right? They do, they do the police in voices. Like that's a, that's the draft of the wasteland, right? Like, I, yeah, well, yes, exactly. I mean, yeah. I, th that's, I remember that from the, I guess it was the, the manuscript that had all of Pound's notes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that might have been one of the original titles of it, I think. I think that was yeah. the original title of uh, The Wasteland. Um, so you had that in there, but then you had another one that I just, I couldn't quite um, place it. I knew it's an echo of something. Some, something in us adores, like what's that from? That's like a, that, that's, uh, that's like a line of poetry too, no? I, okay, I thought you, I thought you would. Uh, th that's one of those things where I, tr I tried, like that like was a transmission. I tried to, like find where that came from and apparently it came from me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> uh, some, something else I, don't, I mean. It's an echo of some other poem that I know. It's, it is oh. an echo. I can't, I can't quite place it though. I thought you would have it at your fingertips, but. Yeah, yeah. maybe, uh, I mean, ho ho hopefully I. Oh, it's okay, you can take yeah. it. Don't worry about that. I mean, you can you can sample it. Poets poets don't sue each other, so I think you can, you know, you can, you can have that. If they if they do, they won't get a lot of money if they do sue you. So, the, I I build on that same idea in the final poem, um, the deluge. There's, um, it's like a long poem at the end of the book about the death of my father. And there's, I don't know if I can find it readily. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not able to find it. There's another like whole Oh wait, here it is. Um, facing it allowed all that is unrehearsed to telegraph through time, rearranged in a game of hide and seek. Something in me loved the puzzle I both made and solved at the same time. I liked to trick and be tricked and tried to hide inside the seeking and in the hiding tried to seek. In plain air, only the lost look for the lost. Running for my life, became a kind of stillness. That's a, that's a, that's a classic uh, Aaron Fagan line there. You know, like if you bring in the childhood, like bringing in sort of like, you know, childhood thing with these sort of, it just sort of zooms out into the universe, into the eternity, you know, so nice. Uh, so, so other people can ask questions. If anyone else have any questions, we have a few minutes left. Anyone have any questions? I guess that's the thing, right? That, will they write them in or something, uh, Kelsey, or just, Will they just raise their hands? How will they do this? Yeah, either way works. Uh, we do have one uh, person okay. who chimed in on the chat. Um, well, maybe two, Amy and Brian. Um, and their question is for Aaron. They say, hey, Aaron, uh, would you uh, talk about writing first person poems? Are you the narrator, identifying with the narrator, channeling a narrator, dot, dot, dot? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I, I guess I think of, like the I is being something that's like always provisional, that it's um, just an experiment. You know, I, I often think of like how absurd the, the, the first person pronoun is. It looks like an I beam or like some sort of like pedestal or monument that we sort of build some kind of 
there, there's the self-created self, like the, the, the one that we make up, like our own delusion. And then there's the delusion that's projected onto us and between our idea of who we are and what the world expects of us or they project onto us. There's these two competing platforms of an idea of who a person is and who you really are is completely lost in translation between both of those polar extremes. Um, so I think in my poems, I try to, I, I guess, uh, deconstruct all of those ideas. I mean, I've, I've found that my, my own conception of self, like who I am, has been uh, more of a source of pain and suffering than anything that's been a place of refuge or solace. Um, I'm the unreliable narrator of my own life and have been my whole life. And, but so rather than that being sort of like a dark proposition, it's one that I take joy in. Um, I'm not destroyed by it. I'm, I'm happily destroyed by it every moment of every day to just be uh, constantly iterative and just keep revising it being a, 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 a fluid concept rather than one that is a static. That's how, how does that work for you, Nick? Um, yeah, Camilla has a question. I, I'm not sure if her, does, do you want me to answer this question that she just answered? Or do you want me to answer? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, the first person. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it is, it is, you know, I agree. It is, it is, you know, clearly a construct. I mean, all writing is a construct. Um, but I, I do sort of, I think that the moment of writing the poem, though, gets as close to um, uh, whatever the self is as, as, as possible. Um, that there is this moment of like of, of creation, uh, and there's other moments too in, in in life. It's sort of like when it when it sort of lines up. Like meditation seems to be a big part of your practice, also as it is with mine. And I think you know the moment when we do sort of enter into uh, whatever this this moment is uh, does seem to be when if there is a self it does emerge uh and i think it does come out in in ideally in in uh you know in one way it comes out it can be in poetry i think that's why we go to poetry is because we get to sort of get a glimpse into someone else's um interior life and we get to get a sense of what it is to be someone else which is a i mean it, it's a construct but it also it, it's a, it's an interesting construct at the very least uh <laughs> we're all carrying it around and all wrestling with it so uh, I, I find I don't I don't I used to wrestle with it more like the idea of like you know putting I and what the I is and what people think of it I don't think about it too much now I just sort of I, I, I it, it's it's fluid it, it moves around and changes as I as I as I write so yeah thanks Camilla yeah I'm curious this this new uh, body of work that you're working on with the collages um, you know you you've what was the was the title stay yeah the which is uh about the the different kinds of collaborative i mean you're a highly collaborative artist you know i'm just curious how you envision is this going to be a book length uh project are you not really putting pressure on yourself for it to materialize in that way or yeah it, it's just right now it's fun it's just a fun project to do um you know, the last book, which answers like Dylan asked the question about music and how it informs your work. And, and the last, the I Will Destroy You book, the whole the whole process of that was I, I, I formed a band with some friends and we performed all the song, all the poems uh, for like the years of writing. And that was the revision process was if it worked, if it worked as a song, then it became a poem. And so the book is just released without the, you know, it's not scored or anything. It's not music with it, but I can hear the music and I think it's in the poems now. And so now this is another process where I'm doing it with these visual, these visuals. And, and uh, you know, maybe they'll, I, I imagine it'll be more like this. I'll just sort of sh maybe show them, show a slideshow of them while I do a reading. And I, I don't know if they'll be in the book or not. I, I, I can, I, I would like them just to exist as poems, uh, you know, just sort of have that energy. Maybe on the cover, there'll be one of them or something, you know, so. I've been doing all these video poems with uh, music and visuals. Uh, uh, Camilla has done 
she's a visual artist and she's done a lot with uh, collage and stop motion animation and so on. So where, I'll use- Where can we find stuff. those? Where are those? Uh, I've, I've got a YouTube channel. They're also on my website. I've got a video section there. I did like a few book trailers for, uh, for, for the new book and they're, they're, they're pretty fun. Like how they come together, finding a piece of music and a visual and a poem. And it's this kind of alchemical yeah. thing. It just, you just know, know on an intuitive level when it's, when it's, when it's working and it's really great fun because, you know, I imagine it's a similar motivation that um, just offers a different way to experience the work. Um, I, I, I like to get that ch chamber of energies uh, bouncing around and moving. It, I think it draws out more of what's there. Um, well, it's great. I'll check, I'll check those out. I, that, that, that sounds good. That sounds great. I'll, I'll definitely check those out. So. Thank you. So, yeah, like, uh, yeah, like Nick mentioned, there was um, a question for you, Erin, about um, the, you talked a little bit about it just now, but um, like the relationship to music and how it informs your work. It's from Dylan. He says, I noticed the body slash head reference and other references to frequencies and notes. Um, so if you uh, could elaborate a little bit more on music specifically and how it informs. Sure. Uh, the, the, uh, Body Head was a concert that I went to in Kingston, New York. Uh, th that's one of Kim Gordon's um, sort of noise projects. I went to a concert with, uh, with, with Camilla there and that was just an amazing Time, the, the, the poem that I read earlier, uh, Everything You Do is a Balloon, that's a title from uh, a Boards of Canada song. Um, you know, there's lots of different poems that draw from a tradition of, you know, naming the title after a piece by Mozart or something, you know, why isn't it, you know, just as acceptable to name a poem after a Boards of Canada tune. Um, their, their music, you know, that kind of electronic music. There's uh, another, well, it's in that poem. Um, I referred to a ghost box, which is a tool that's used by ghost hunters, you know, whether you believe in that sort of thing or not, just the idea is really powerful. It's like a, a frequency scanner that ghost hunters use to communicate with spirits on the other side. I just love the name ghost box, but it's also, um, a record publisher in the UK. They do all this psychedelic um, electronica, really, really beautiful, beautiful music. I've just been obsessed with them lately. So uh, yeah, I draw a huge amount of inspiration from music. Um, Zo Zoe uh, Hitzig posted one of the links for one of the videos in the chat area, so. Thank you, Zoe. Zoe, Zoe Hitzig, what a great poet too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for coming, Zoe. All right, did anybody have any other questions for our readers tonight? You can either put it in the chat or if you wanted to unmute one and chat with us directly, you're welcome to do that. Um, and also just a reminder that we are here in the store right now. Um, and so if you wanted to pick up a copy of A Better Place is Hard to Find, we have them. Um, and then we also have copies of Nick's I Will Destroy You. Um, and so you can give us a call. Our uh, phone number is 512, um, I, I'm like, Will I say it wrong? I don't know. 512-322-2097. And it's in the chat as well. So, um, and you're welcome to give us a call, you know, leave us a message and we'll always get back to you on that. All right. So any other questions? Anyone? Those were such amazing questions too. So thanks to everyone who 
you asked them. Just They're great fun. Thank you. Yeah. Super yeah, thanks. It was, it was great. Thanks, Aaron. It was really great to hear the book, Aaron. Congratulations. And uh, you thank know. you. And I just want to reiterate like how grateful I am to Malvern Books uh, for giving uh, poetry a space to breathe tonight and share with uh, friends and strangers, uh, bring everybody together and um, please support uh, Malvern Books. You know, independent bookstores are a total lifeline and uh, sort of a refuge for sanity in very weird times. So grateful to Malvern Books and I'm very grateful to Nick. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, it's been such a wonderful evening. Um, so thanks to Erin, thanks to Nick. Um, we, we miss having people in the store and we're happy to be able to provide this virtual space, like I mentioned. So thanks to everybody for showing up too. Good um, luck. Yeah. There were. Was there someone trying to speak that I spoke over them? No, I, cl I accidentally clicked on Aaron, uh, Aaron's uh, video that Zoe had. Did, uh, I know, I'm so excited to check that yeah. out as well. That was my bad, my bad. <laughs> If I was if I was savvier, I would have done a screen share thing, but I didn't. I wouldn't dare <laughs> too much of a plebe. <laughs> it's it's pretty easy. Uh, it's not that hard. <laughs> uh, all right, I guess we're good, huh? Thank you. Thank you guys so much. That was wonderful. Thank you all for being there, um, and you know support your local indies and read some poetry, take care of yourselves.